ओम सहनावतु सहनाव बुनतु साहवीरम करवाहि तेजस्वी नावदीतम मस्तुमाविदिशावहि ओम शांति 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 हरि ओम तत्सत में ही प्रोटेक्ट अस बोथ में ही नरेश अस बोथ May he give vigor to us and energy. May our studies be energetic. May we not cavil with each other. Peace, peace, peace be unto all. Uh, so we normally start. Are there any questions? I did have a question. I can't remember what it was. I mean, for so sure. this chapter, I find it a bit uh, strange because look at the context. So there are two armies, huge armies, ready to fight, kill each other, and there are horses, elephants, and there they are these corn shells, and everything is blowing. And Arjun's uh, his great grandfather is coming to kill him, his guru is coming to kill him, and Krishna is telling him, put the kusha grass, uh, put some white cloth on top, sit there, meditate. Uh, it it seems like a little bit of a misfit to me. Mm. So, uh, is Krishna really expecting Arjun to sit down in the middle of the battlefield and uh, has his mind focused on God? In a sense, yes. In a sense, no. Not literally so, because if you look at the instructions, you find a quiet place, find a nice place, you know, with conducive surroundings and so on, in the middle of a battlefield, and yet the mindset should be like that. So the idea is that in the middle of our battlefield, our mind should be kept in equilibrium, a state of sthita pratnya, steady wisdom. And the basis for that is because of what Krishna instructs in the beginning. And that is, although we feel that we are mixed up in all of this, although we feel that we are in some kind of battlefield very often, and that we'll believe it, sometimes in unjust circumstances, according to our interpretation, then we feel that we have only a few options left over to us. Arjuna thought that his option would be to withdraw from everything. He thought that was a sanctimonious thing to do, to sit in a cave, withdraw, like any of these sadhus. And that sounds on the surface a reasonable thing, but is it escapism? And so we expect, on the face of it, Sri Krishna to say, yes, you're doing the right thing. Be non-violent. Withdraw yourself. And sit and meditate. But what he's doing is, ultimately, in the whole of the Bhagavad Gita, is giving a comprehensive formula for life that includes meditation. And only one chapter of the 18 chapters is dedicated to the subject. So all the other avenues are open to us. So as I said many, many times before, where do we start our spiritual life? Where we stand. And Arjun stood in the middle of a battlefield. But to extent, we all sit in the middle of a battlefield. Or it feels like that. Where we have only a few limited yeah. options, we can move towards something, attack it aggressively, or withdraw from it, or yield to the circumstance, stand mesmerized. So very often, this whole world that we described as Maya, a kind of statement of fact that things are not quite what they seem to be, and yet we relate to them as all the world is permanent and lasting. And therefore when people live and are born and are die, we react either by grieving, the biggest pinch on us is death, and the prospect of death. And so Arjuna is grieving over that. But the wise neither grieve for the living and the dead. Why do we grieve? Because we're not wise. And so this wisdom, inculcating this wisdom, is the remaining few, if, if several chapters of the Bhagavad Gita. 18 chapters are there, 18 yogas are there, describing comprehensively what it is. How to get out of this, how to revalue things, and then reformulate our reaction to a circumstance. Each person will have and identify their own individual battlefield. But all of us circumscribe the same general position, that we stand in a certain place assuming that we have to do battle with 
every person, place and event opposite us. And that, in many instances, we stand alone. Now, devotion is also taken into account. The path of devotion is also taken into account. And all these songs that we sing, how many times do we say, or use the expression, taking refuge? We take refuge. We take refuge at the feet of the Lord. It's a beautiful poetic expression. An expression that indicates a sense of being devoted, a devoutness is there. On Sunday it was asked, why should we not meditate on the face? Well, of course we can do that. Why do we use the feet? It's a position of humility. It's an oriental custom that we take the dust of somebody's feet. We start with the feet and work our way up, knowing that we may not be pure enough to catch the full blaze of glory of the face face of God. In any case, what are we taking refuge in? Many take refuge in drugs. Many take, people take refuge in drink. Many people take refuge in multiple pleasures, physical pleasures, thinking really that this will be an adequate formula. But it's hollow. And the evidence of that is that we have to repeat it. There's no satisfaction in it. So here the Bhagavad Gita tells us, talks about this avenue of satisfaction, this idea of fullness, that if we drink from the blissful ocean of the Lord, of the Divine, then it satisfies all our desires, because the basis for it is our own nature being not only Sat, existence, but also Chit, but also Ananda, bliss. And in very often the Upanishads will compare this. Taitiri Upanishad compares levels of layers of bliss. So whatever you think is blissful, multiply it by ten and you have another avenue of blissfulness. Some people's idea of bliss is eating, eating food. We mentioned on Sunday a question, do you eat to live or live to eat? <laughs> do you wake up in the morning thinking, I wonder, what is for breakfast? And then what is for lunch? The whole day was oriented around, orientated around that. Is an example. So Sri Ramakrishna puts this in a category of greed. He, he puts it like this gold, but everything is to do with not only a desire for an object, and the object can be external and internal, or internal. A desire to be loved is an internal example. But everywhere, it's because we have a seeming felt ga gap here. We don't feel satisfied. Some feeling of inadequacy that we have to fill from the outside. That's called a desire. And as long as we have that feeling, that feeling of hollowness, and feel it can be fitted appropriately and filled from the outside, then we will feel frustrated. And although a desire may satisfy us for a while, the fact that we have to repeat it, what is greed? Greed means, I want it over and over and over again. Once is not enough. And the habit level gives us a clue, please repeat it, unless a new habit is formed. So, what are the characteristics of being within a battle? Confusion. Confusion is one of them. Grief is one of them. The idea of unsettlement the idea of indecision. All of these are characteristic of not exactly knowing where to do and choosing wrongly. Thinking that this is the best alternative that we have. But a wise teacher such as Krishna tells us something different. And unexpectedly, from if you may say the listener's point of view, the audience's point of view, if you want to use it as a kind of portrayal of a drama, the unusual thing is, we expect to agree with Arjun. We expect the Lord to agree with Arjun and say, yes, violence is wrong. You need to come away from it. But he doesn't say anything of the kind. Where does this manly, unmanliness come from? It doesn't become you. Yield not to unmanliness is a wonderful call that echoes throughout the ages. And the key value in spirituality is strength. When we give 
some affirmations as I do from time to time. We start off strong, true, wise, full, free, truth, beauty, goodness, love, harmony. We start off with strong because it requires strength. It requires resolution, resolve, strength. And it requires steadiness. It is uh, it's often said, isn't it, that what the question is posed, what takes the greater strength? Is it to let the horses go, using the analogy of a chariot, and a charioteer and horses, horses representing the five senses, ten senses really, senses of reaction and senses of uh, absorption, information input and reactivity. So it requires strength to restrain that, more strength than just to let it go. What we call the mind, basically comprising a, a tracking of some component of which we call attention. Where is our attention wandering? We can stand back and poise ourselves and see it's wandering here, wandering there, wandering there. Looking at that, we can see it is something like taking a dog for a walk. We allow the, the dog to wander off. If we don't control it, if it's an untrained, <coughs> it will wander off forever and get carried away by sniffing here and sniffing there. But a well-trained dog or a dog attached to the master will ultimately come back and say, and now look at you in expectation with tongue hanging out, panting. What now, master? Looking at it like that and we say, it moves the heart, how cute is that? And we give it some direction. But we have to be firm with it. You can see dogs that uh, householders, households that you visit and the dog is being considered part of the household and jumps up and leaves bloody paw, paw prints on you and so on and so forth. And you smile nicely, but inwardly you're thinking, I wish somebody would control this dog. He's scratching and tearing at my cloth and leaving muddy imprints on me. You're too polite to say it. But of course, a good owner of the dog will know in advance. And a mere word, sometimes a mere look will do it. Children operate in this way too. See? A mere look will be sufficient to give a clue about your approval or disapproval. And a child will know it. But you have to carry it through. So the mind is, very, is the same thing. And we all heard the mind, uh, how the mind is compared to the monkey mind, the monkey, the story about how it rests by its own nature. And then various adventures occur to it. So among them is being stung by a scorpion, being drunk by wine, uh, uh, the wine of desire, the scorpion of jealousy and so on, possessed by a ghost and so on. But rest is by its own nature. In the Ramayana we find Hanuman. And some people think there's the Lord in the form of a monkey. But let's see what is the psychological aspect of it. It's the mind. The mind imbued with strength and determination is powerful enough to jump across the ocean. It's that same mind that was restless, like a monkey, and is now also subdued by us, and, but imbued with strength, and is able to overcome every different difficulty. What is the source of that strength is Sri Krishna's words. You think you are this. You think you're an individual, but actually, you are the immortal, infinite, invisible. You are the divine whose depth is unfathomable. Water cannot wet you, fire cannot burn you, wind cannot dry you, etc. See, you are the Atman, you are the immortal self. This is not instinctive. It's not an instinctive thing, except it comes through instinctually in a mixed up way. We can't imagine that we'll ever die. We can imagine our corpse lying there but some objective viewer is there, watching it. And we have a sense of humor sometimes. Every human being likes to laugh. I never met a human being who said, my goal is to be unhappy. Everyone wants to be happy. Is this not a symptom of our innermost nature of bliss? And in the sixth chapter, the subject of bliss is mentioned multiple times. The 27th stanza here says, Supreme bliss truly comes to that yogi whose mind is calm. 
Why are we not? Why do we not feel this supreme bliss? If this is our own nature, should we not feel it perpetually? It's because we're out of touch with it. And it comes to the yogi, that is, the one who has taken measures to discipline the mind, one who has taken measures to steer this attention in a different direction, away from the temptation of saying, I am a victim, or I have to deal with things on my own without taking refuge in God. I have to take refuge in something else. And all the desires come from egoistic positions, which says, my interest is paramount. Sometimes good works, or seen, good works are seen to be good on the face of it, but we find that they are egoistically driven. We find that they are really for name and fame or some other motive. Look at me, I did something good. Or, even if that's not there, an internal satisfaction, an internal script that says, I did something good. Now, it's better to do something good than to do something disastrous and bad and evil and so on, yes. And yet, it hooks us in, it still binds us. So that yogi, that is that person, whose mind is calm, how do we calm the mind? We can view the mind as something like a turbulent series of waves that come out erratically, some big, some small. And the calming is a progressive thing. How do we know this? Because we are told that calming the mind, bringing it to a state of quietude, quietude little by little, not all at once, progressively, manageably, starting off with huge turbulent area, and then progressively less waves, less waves, less waves, until completely calm. And the whole idea, referring now to Patanjali Yoga Sutras, we find, is as compared to a lake with all these vrittis, all these whirlpools, all these various disturbances with the mind. And what is our idea? Idea is that if we are to calm these, compared to a lake where the waves and all the whirlpools and all the disturbances are stirring up the mud from the bottom and there's no clarity. And so no clarity means confusion. We're all confused. We don't really know what is what. We have, we have to really try to get this and apply this capacity for discernment. What we can call is viveka and interpreted as discrimination is probably better phrased as discernment. Be discerning. Because have we, uh, we, the English language is itself confusing. When we talk about discrimination, some people, if you don't qualify what you mean, think, oh, racial discrimination, gender discrimination, you know, it's wrong to discriminate, discriminate between this and that and the other. But discerning, being a discerning person, sorting things out, in a clear and precise and concise way, with an element of reasoning to it. What is permanent? What is impermanent? In that sense, what is real? What is unreal? What is valuable? What is not valuable? What is pain-bearing? What is non-pain-bearing? Very often what looks like something that brings us pleasure and is non-pain-bearing on the surface is actually brings us pain. And this comes from attachment. So later on in the Bhagavad Gita, here in this very chapter, a formula, twofold formula is given. What should we do? We should apply practice, abhyasa yoga. Practice. What is practice? Practice is continuously bringing the mind back. When the attention wanders, bring it back lovingly, patiently, good humoredly, back to what is described as the self. The self, what religion calls God. If you're a devotee, you do it in a non-demanding way. Bring it lovingly back to the center, to your center, your innermost center. Makes you centered and balanced. So, second thing is vairagya, detachment. It's not possible to drive a car if you think you're the car. If you're convinced that you are the full master of the car 
And when it veers off to this way, you learn through habit to make an immediate adjustment without thinking you do it. When similarly, when the mind's tendency is to go off one way, in a rajasic way or tamasic way, that is an egocentric way, then we learn, ah, going off this way, let's adjust it, let's bring in sattva. So how do we neutralize all these waves in the mind? Is by introducing a neutralizing wave that we call sattva. The disturbing waves are all egoistic way, waves because they evoke desires. And so how do we neutralize that? Neutralize, not repress, not suppress. No psychologist will say suppress anything. Every action has an equal and opposite reaction. It'll come back with a vengeance. But neutralize it with something better, with higher values, sattvic values, non-egoistic tendencies. Build that up and saturate the mind in such a way that it settles on the habit level so that when your car, psychological and physical car, goes off this way, automatically you adjust it. The habit is there to do it. You don't have to think about doing it. How do you shift gears in a car? How do you drive here and there? Supposing you drive a car to a certain address and then you change your address. Chances are when you come home from work, you'll drive yourself without thinking to your original address. <laughs> I know I've done it myself. <laughs> and then you say, oh no, no, I'm not going this way. Because the habit is so much, you're free, leaves the mind free to think of many other things. If we're not careful and mindful, then the habit will take over. It's better to have a better habit. What is spirituality? Developing a new and better habit. And that habit then becomes behavior, and that behavior becomes character, and that character becomes a shining avenue to inspire and change others, to be a world mover. Behind me, Sister Nuredita, a world mover. Can we all be world movers? Everyone can. Our potential is that unlimited. So, whose passions are pacified, who has become one with Brahman, and who is sinless. This we covered previously. But just to point out this word, that we are told that this is supreme bliss is attained, and peace of mind also is attained. So this sukham, sukham utaman, this supreme bliss comes. Now we went through this partially previously, but just to review it again, and this is a wonderful uh, uh, commentary given on the Bhagavad Gita because it incorporates words of Sri Ramakrishna. It says, before visiting the humble home of a tenant of his, the landlord sends in advance the required furniture and provision so that the occupant may receive him in a fitting manner. Similarly, before the Lord reveals himself in the heart of a devotee, he endows him with purity, devotion, faith, and such like divine qualities. Our movement is very small. Our small movement creates a matching movement from the divine that brings all these things <coughs> in. That is why by taking refuge in the Lord, we're doing a minimum portion. We're just saying, just as you take shelter from the rain, the minimum thing is you're standing under a shelter. But the shelter itself is doing all the work. The, shelf, the shelter itself is preventing rain from coming on you. And then the next stanza goes on. Yunyam eva evam sadatvam yogi vikata kalma saha svukena brahma samsparsam achyantam sukham ashnute Constantly, constantly engaging the mind in this way. Constantly, no holiday for it. Abhyasa yoga, constantly, whenever wrong, bring it back, bring it back, bring it back. Not just in formal meditation, but in your working, waking life. If you don't do it there, you won't do it in meditation, formal meditation by sitting. The yogi has put away all this sin, that means all this desires, all this egoistic impulses, attains with ease, with no effort, effortlessly, the infinite bliss mentioned again of contact with Brahman, 
Contact with Brahman is a blissful experience, filling you with joy. It's a joyful filling. Like a vessel, you're filled with this bliss, and just as if it were a kind of nectar, it overflows over the vessel and spreads to everywhere, to others, to all people, to all places, to all events, to the world at large. A meditator, a mystic sitting in a cave, is it a useful activity? You often hear much criticism of people in monasteries and convents. They're doing nothing, say people who have a very active temperament and who feel that they are personally obliged to change the world because God is a little senile now. See, he's been sitting there since Genesis with a long beard now. And poor fellow, he created the universe, didn't do such a great job. And now we have to make correct all his mistakes. Well, what did poor God do before you were born? I have no idea. So a corrector of mistakes. If you want to be a professional corrector of mistakes, you'll have infinite opportunities. The Lord will give you the supply that you demand. With ease this comes. Fill up with joy. Those people sitting in the convents, sitting in the monasteries, sitting in the caves, see the power of their thought how it affects every corner of the universe for eons to come, how their blessing is. On uh, uh, Sunday, Sunday evening, uh, Swami Vimokshananda here told us about silent ones, silent ones that we hardly know of at Belumot, silent saint, saints who live their life, not good speakers necessarily, nor writers, or anything of that nature, but living saintly lives. Jesus said, you cannot hide your light under a bushel or a bed. It's there for everyone to see. Light of lights, see the phrase we use. You can't hide it. It shines and has its effect. And even though we don't notice it, it has its effect. These great people, because you see, what is the nature of these great people? is that they spontaneously are moved toward the welfare of the whole world. You can see in the life of Buddha, how he became a Buddha, somebody of enlightened Buddhi, enlightened intellect. And how he was noted for his compassion and his compassionate attitude. We can't avoid it. Spontaneously, this bliss flows over beyond any borders that we might impose or think of and spreads infinitely everywhere, transforming everything in its wake. So he attains with ease this infinite bliss of contact with Brahman. Sri Ramakrishna makes this comment, an immersed vessel is permeated by water inside as well as outside, the soul immersed in Ishwara, that is, immersed in the Lord of the universe cognizes, understands pure consciousness everywhere. Their whole vision is colored with it. And then the question is there, is there any change of vision of the world affected in the one who realizes himself as this Atman? And so the next few standards describes the perfection in yoga, perfection in this meditation practice. Now, before I go on to that, I put on the whiteboard a few questions. So, these were the questions that came up. Because this, this text asks and provides answers to various questions. The first question I put was, how do we get peace? And why should we even ask that question? Everybody is now tuned in to universal peace. When we do the Enneagram and try and identify personality numbers, there's a certain personality type that avoids conflict at all costs and is known as a peacemaker. And when we do our first uh, attempt to identify uh, personality types, every personality, more or less, let's say not everyone, but 70 to 80% identify themselves as peacemakers because they take that universal ideal and love it so much because everybody says, United Nations tells us we should have peace and there should be peacemakers. And some ways of making peace is to send troops in. 
I'm not sure how that works. Anyhow, how do we get peace? Peace being high up on the human agenda. Not only universal peace, when we look at the news and so on and see global affairs, we see uh, not so much peace. And it's all those incidences of war and turmoil that are mainly highlighted, unfortunately. But also we find lack of peace individually in our own life. You examine it, you see, I wish I was more peaceful. Now every time we wish for something, it's an assertion we don't have it. So if you say I would like to be peaceful, it means I'm not peaceful. If you say I'd like abundance, it means I'm not so well off myself. And soon you'll find that the definition of happiness is a definition of your current status quo so that when you say, I am fine, how are you? I'm fine. It means I don't yet have arthritis. See? But if you had arthritis, you're not so fine. See, So it's a statement, it's a negative statement. It's, a, it's saying, at, at the moment, I don't have some negative condition. See? I'm fine. What does it mean? Well, I have shelter. But as soon as the mortgage people take the house away, then I'm not so fine. <laughs> Swamiji, what should, what should you say then? Don't refuse to answer, is it? <laughs> huh? Like for, if, if you don't say, I'm fine, what should you say? You should say, I'm fine. I, the Atman, am all fine, always fine. See how Swami Shivananda, Mahapurush Maharaj, used to answer in the, in the depths of a great, great illness and sickness. He had had a stroke and everything. And he was asked, well, how are you? And he always used to answer, I'm fine, but the body is not so well. <laughs> but I myself, I'm fine. So I'm perfect. The, the words remain the same. It's the thought behind There's it. It's the thought behind it, absolutely. You see, you, see. you see, because if somebody says, how are you? And you truly answer, the person will be there for days. <laughs> I have this, I have that. And then, how long have you got? You know, how, how long have you got? You see, please sit down, let me tell you. Now we're in for a long saga. And when you see the person looking at their watch, you say, oh, no, 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 I haven't finished yet. And my mother-in-law this, and then uh, they're, they're, and these people are giving me so much trouble. And they look what happened, the bank people are now demanding this, and uh, so on and so forth, you see. So all of these things come up. Oh, and did I tell you about my arthritic knee? No, no, well, that's at the end of the list, but I'll come to that later, because there's a whole list for the further to go through. So if we really were interested, how are you, is a catch question. Because if it's a genuine question, given general answer, most people will give such a comprehensive answer that it becomes tedious. And then you ask that person, how are you? Not well, I was fine until I met this person and I said, how are you? <laughs> so contentment equals thankfulness. See, one of the conditions of Niyam in Patanjali Yoga Sutras, this observer, this, observa, uh, this um, observances, enhanced purification, one of the five things required is contentment, is another way of saying being thankful. I'm thankful, I have gratitude for what I have. The wonderful Joel Goldsmith, who wrote this book, The Art of Meditation, he puts the definition of meditation so beautifully it's a song of gratitude that God is here, God is now, God is love. What a beautiful sentiment and a beautiful definition for devotional meditation. What is devotional meditation? Practicing the presence of God in an intensive way, having done it anyway in your working, waking life. That is why one of the simple books given to any devotee first coming here would be, please read this book by Brother Lawrence, practicing the presence. He was somebody who thought he would do better by becoming a monk in France. And he said, my only complaint was, I thought I'd be here to do hard tapasya, hard austerity, and be punished for all the wickedness and childish ways of, that I had. What was my disappointment when I found it was all joy. <laughs> It disappointed, that was all joy. What was the joy? The joy was in any activity. He always had his companion, Lord of the universe, his beloved with him as his friend, as his companion. 
doesn't matter what he was doing, the activity was unimportant. Un answering the door, cooking the food, cleaning the floors. It was all done with the idea of the eternal presence, the living, the living and overwhelmingly blissful and joyful presence of the divine lover with me constantly. So there's a beautiful book, Practicing the Presence, Brother Lawrence. So constantly doing this is the point. Without a break, without a holiday. The heart knows how to do it, as I've told you many times before. It knows the art of being a peristaltic pump. Pump and rest, pump and rest. So in the midst of a pumping, that is activity, the mind at least can rest, either before an activity or after activity, or if you get in the habit during the activity, everything coming from a poised position, a detached position, vairagya. So these two things are there, necessarily, abhyasa yoga, and that is constantly bringing the attention back to the divine. And then the other one is vairagya, being detached, because it is only when we get tied up in it. What is karma yoga? Being detached from the fruits of your activities. Being detached in such a way that you don't get disturbed. What is all yoga practices? Let us not disturb the mind. Let us try and bring it to a place of equilibrium. Regardless of whether you're practicing jnana yoga, karma yoga, bhakti yoga, or dhyana yoga. So, how do we get peace of mind? Curbing the objective desires and fixing the attention on the divine self. Another question that comes up, does this uh, happen all at once? And the answer is quite clear in the text. No, it's little by little. Progressively bring the mind to a state of quietude. And so, by waves, progressively being smaller and smaller, more subtle, less troublesome, until finally, in Patanjali's example, we find sattva having neutralized all the egoistic tendencies contained within rajas and tamas. These are the evolutionary forces. We are able to get the clarity. We haven't removed the lake. We simply make it so calm that we are able to see what is at the bottom. And in the analogy, the bottom is the divine self, in the yogic language, purusha. And that purusha derives from two words, puri, a city, and purna, fullness. Because if you think that it is inside, like a captured bird, you'll make a mistake. Because not only is it within, but it's also everywhere, presence is all pervasive. So that's the other question. I have to get back these other questions. Who asked these questions, Swamiji? It's in the text. All these questions are not asked like this, but they're all in the text. Which all the answers are there. Which text? Sixth chapter of the Bhagavad Gita oh, right. is what we're studying. Then, how to control the restless mind? I mentioned it, Abhyasa and Varagya. Some people get confused about this question of detachment. Detachment does not mean having an impersonal, unemotional attitude. Detachment simply means that there's an instrumentality we have to be aware of. And that all actions are not mine alone. And there's a whole chapter, of course, dedicated to the subject in the Bhagavad Gita, this distinction between what is Prakriti and what is Purusha. And the distinction is has to be made and is part of this discernment because varagya detachment comes from vivek discernment what is the effect supreme bliss we've covered this so we're jumping back and forth between stanzas a little bit and what does it provide it provides one of the most profound passages echoed in many other places Yeshu Upanishad mentions it, Kata Upanishad mentions it. Phrase like this, He who sees all beings in the self and the self in all beings, in this case, is never lost to me. And adds a devotional aspect by saying, He who sees me. So a devotee, through imagination, 
can imagine the Lord of the universe sitting there in the hearts of all beings. Progressively, with a penetrating vision, we can practice an exercise whereby we can understand God dressed up in all these different forms. Just like different pant uh, uh, pantomime characters, as I mentioned before, the advantage in this part of the world of having this drama called pantomimes, where it's necessary to have heroes, heroines, a choir or a chorus, I should say, where it's necessary for some peculiar reason for the hero to be a woman dressed up as a man and for the humorous dame to be a man dressed up as a woman. That itself is a kind of drama. And it's necessary to have a villain that everybody is encouraged to hiss and boo at. <laughs> you see? So these are our standard characteristics in this traditional pantomime. Is this world not like that? Was Shakespeare not so profound in what he was saying? All the world's a stage and we are but players. But do we view it like this? Do we view this as a drama, as something like a Leela Maya? And if that's the case, should our attitude not lighten up a little bit? Should we not see this world for what it truly is? Is it easy? Sometimes not. How can you say that somebody suffering is part of a pleasant play? No. But we have to view it differently. At the end of the day, all of this is various waves. And we can only see things from a fixed view. And all these various waves are subject not only to time and space, but also to causality and function. We can't blame an unsuspecting God for this. It is all to do with this activity of the mind. So these questions are there. And the answers are also supplied. And we'll come on to that passage shortly. Then the next question, is it easy for us to do this? No, it's not. Who said it was easy? Is it easy to play a game of rugby? I mentioned that because he's a rugby player. Is it, is it easy to do that? You have to do some training. You then have to, so a fitness level is required. To do that, you have to have the enthusiasm to do it. And when you're playing, it's no good saying, I think I can play this game of rugby if there are no opposition players that can very roughly tackle me and possibly injure me. And yet I take it on board. I'm quite happy to do it. And men do that. They go in with great gusto and enthusiasm and come out with broken noses and limbs and everything and are quite happy about it somehow. This with the game of rugby, game of life, is it seriously any different? Should we not have opposition players if we are to play the game? Should there not be difficult situations? Is it not our art of making this uh, delightful sport? Is it not incumbent on us to learn the art of getting around it? If there are thorns on a road, should we not just put tough shoes on? If there are great hollows in a road, as we find, say, in some parts of Africa, should we not just engage a four-wheel drive? We have the equipment, what we call the earth car, and the earth, the earth car with this earth engine called the mind. We have the capacity to overcome and surmount every obstacle, but it requires some things, purity, perseverance, Patience. These three virtues are necessary. It requires faith. It requires fearlessness. It requires freedom. These are easy things I'm providing for ease of remem remembrance. Three P's, three F's, three D's. It requires a strong desire, a yearning heart. It requires determination and it requires dedication. Now we apply all of this, all of these skills when we are enthusiastic about some of the challenges in life that we take on as enjoyable. A reframing of life itself will give us the same attitude, a sporting attitude to all these difficulties. And can you see if this is applied in Arjun's case, how by reframing things, how you can overcome your original impulse, which is a reaction. Stand back a little bit. Nothing you can do about the original reaction. It can fall into either sattvic 
rajasik or tamasik. If it's sattvic, nothing to be done. But if it's rajasik and tamasik, standing back and finding out what went wrong, reviewing it. See, four hours are there. Reaction, reviewing, and then revaluing it, putting it in its proper perspective, and then creating a better reaction full of sattva. Doing it repeatedly until our first reaction is really the fourth one coming out. It's a new habit being formed. So it's not easy, but no sport is easy. And we do the small portion of it. We walk one mile, the Lord walks a hundred. We do one small thing, you see, the wind of God's grace is ever blowing. We have but to set our sail. But is it any, is it easy to set the sail? It's not easy. Anybody who's done sailing, I mentioned before, will have to find a mast. We'll have to hoist it. We'll have to find out where all the ropes go. And we'll have to hoist the sail. I didn't think it was easy. And yet, we, no matter how much we huff and puff on the sail, it won't move an inch. The wind does the lion's share. It carries us. Our, our portion is minimal. In the Christian language, God's angels make the crooked path straight. God goes ahead of us, before us, and makes the crooked path straight. What if we fail is a good question. Well, and here we'll find toward the end of this chapter, this question Arjun asks basically. What if we cannot reach this high ideal, this perfection in yoga, this equilibrium of mind? What happens? Because the mind is turbulent, so restless. It's like a huge wind. Remember, compared to meditation, compared to a flame in a windless place. But it's the wind you have to deal with. It's all very well not having wind. How do we get rid of the wind? How do we calm the storm? The mind is turbulent, is a question asked by Arjun. Then what if we fail? Our wonderful, wonderful message of encouragement is, consider this universe like a grand, this existence like a grand university with multiple opportunity to pass the exams. Nothing ever wasted, no good effort ever wasted, all accumulated, all packed in our baggage to carry over, all taken with us, all accumulated, so that we are born the next time in a favorable circumstance. So what if we fail? Well, the good get carried f from inside. And uh, no effort is wasted. No effort is wasted. So we'll these are stanzas we haven't yet uh, uh, explored, but just to give you a framework for these stanzas to come. We'll deal with one or two and then leave it there. Sarva Bhuta Stam Atmanam Sarva Bhutani Chatmani Ikshate Yoga Yuktatma Salvatra Samadarshanaha. So we find this. His mind, being harmonized by yoga, he sees himself in all beings and all beings in himself. He sees the same in all. This is not just the effect of it. You see, it's a kind of a cycle. It's not just the effect of it, it's the cause of it also. Cultivating the habit of doing this will create the effect. And the effect itself will come spontaneously. When we see the self through the clarified mind, we see it not only inside, we see it inside everywhere. We see it pervading everywhere. We see our attitude being cultivated as God is inside everyone. And that develops into operating through everything and everyone. And then as, and then beyond. You can see the divine glories that are laid out from chapter seven and 9 and 10 and various places we see assembled here as divine glories or translated into English. It doesn't say, 
I am like the sapidity and water. He says, I am the sapidity and water. Of all, the, of all the sciences, I am the science of the self. I am. Everywhere it says, I am this. I am. And so that's a progressive understanding that comes spontaneously. An internal vision occurs which says, I am that. That is that. The God is that. In the beginning, in. We take the opportunity to see the Lord is inside everything. But is it contained there like a caged bird? Is it trapped? No. It's not only in, but it's through everything. Operating all hands, all eyes, all heads, all legs, everywhere. A thousand eyes, a thousand heads, a thousand arms, a thousand hands, everywhere. And then as that realization dawns, and beyond. So wonderful, wonderful statement. Supposing everybody was to catch this equal, equal mindedness and see equally this self everywhere, evaluating every human life in this way. This would be the panacea for every social discontent, for every situation where peace does not prevail, for every social injustice. When we see that God equally present in all and all beings in the self, he sees the same in all. All this idea of separateness is gone. What is our only difficulty? A sense of separateness, a sense of isolating myself in a small sphere of operation and not seeing any further and making I the primary player so that all my reactions become either defensive or attacking or mesmer mesmerized, yielding. These are the three things. The fourth option is love. Because when I see the self in all, and all in the self, spontaneously an overwhelming feeling of love comes and affects everywhere. And then he sees me, he sees me everywhere and sees all in me. He never becomes lost to me. You say, you see that phrase, have you found God? In response, I didn't know he was lost. No, I found God. Where was he? Was he hiding? Yes, in a sense, he was hiding. Why can we not spontaneously see God? Because that's part of the characteristics. Damasic, the Damasic aspect is a hiding aspect. Hey, Swamiji, remember you were asking the, the question, uh, how do we find peace? Yes. And it, like, that's the same question. Yes. It's always there. We yes. just forgot that we are peaceful. Isn't that yeah, it? absolutely. Yes, it's always there. Now, of course, what you said helps by... Um, being devoted to God and uh, worshiping Him, being thankful, of course, encourages. Uh, yeah. But um, it's there, even the, even despite that, isn't it? Our nature is always full, always free. Our nature is peace. Our nature is existence itself, is consciousness itself, is bliss itself, is infinite also, ananta. So. That being there, how is it we don't know it? But is the scattered mind not part of our nature? No. The scattered mind is part of the, the human nature, the biological nature, but not intrinsic to our essential nature. Hmm. It's our assumed nature. Our biological nature is our assumed nature. When we shift our valuation, we see it as our instrumental nature. See the difference? If you take it as your instrumental nature, now you're in control. If you take the car as a, uh, let's say, we come about with artificial intelligence and all cars are self-driven. And there is such a car actually. So a certain car I traveled in, but you see the driver never took his hands off the wheel because he didn't have enough confidence in the car. So if you, if you allow the car to go by itself without any proper controls or programming, where will the car go? It'll go into the ditch. And so it requires us to take hold of it and steer it in the right direction on the basis that I am that entity that has control and mastery over this car. The car is an instrument for me to get from A to B. And when I look after it well, then it serves me well. But all the idea is that the Lord is within. That's all. Why should we take care of the body Sri Ramakrishna himself answers it. It's like a jewel box. A jewel box is ornamented, it's ornate because something precious sits inside it. 
So we look after the instrumentation, but our confusion is we identified as, you see, what is the definition in the Patanjali Yoga Sutras of egoism? It's where the seer and the seeing get mixed up. They get confused. And then you say, I am this. Vivekananda gives this idea in that same text of anger. We start off by observing, here's a wave, here's a wave, anger. It comes up, by the time it reaches its peak, we say, I am angry, we identified with the wave. This identification gives us the problem. So while we are all full and free and perfect, the coverings are there. And what we have to do is remove layer after layer after layer of what collectively is called ignorance. So I mean, you can't be a sinner unless you've got an ego, isn't that? Uh, I mean, the concept of being a sinner is uh, absurd if there's no ego, isn't that? Well, you see, if you're a sinner, if you say you're a sinner, you're starting off from a defective position. That's the ego, isn't it? Well, it's a theological position also that tells you this and that says, yes, that I am an ego, that is, I am... I'm separate, I'm a sinner. I am an entity that is a body-mind complex, that is a human entity subject to the laws and whims of some kind of creator God. That's a theological position. Mm -hmm. But you see, and it might be useful also for some basic understandings. But of course, the Vivekananda says, if you say repeatedly, Ramakrishna also, I am a sinner, I am a sinner, then you will be a sinner. You are, a sinner. You are actually creating your own destiny. It's much better to start off with a positive idea. That is why Sri Krishna himself does it. Because Arjuna's position was like that. Arjuna's position was that I am a defective person with a difficult situation and the best thing for me to do is to, slay me. to withdraw. And uh, yes, there's an option. Much better if they slayed me, actually. See, Krishna's position is a position of strength. But Krishna's position is a position, and for all of us, it starts off with strength. Be strong, stand up, be manly. See, and what would happen if and, two and, people and, have the same two people of the same <coughs> strength. Would they not just continue to? But the strength comes from the embodied. The strength comes from a source which is the infinite, invisible. We might call it the entity which has no weakness within it, no parts within it, Same no time parts. within it, no space within it. Some entity which is there, which is pure existence, nothing to change, nothing to add to, nothing to take away from. Purnamada, you see that prayer of fullness. Everything is fullness. Yeah, this is full, that is full, everything is full. Nothing to add to it. If something is full, that's that's it. There's nothing more. See the, the example. You go to a business course and they tell you, be optimistic. There are two types of people. One views the glass half full. There's a, an optimist. The other one views it as half empty, a pessimist. But we say no. A real optimist is the glass is always full and overflowing. It's never half anything. So understand that. And when you understand that intrinsically as your poor, pure nature, in principle, the next thing is the practice has to catch up. So establish the principle first. This is the way this is laid out. Sri Krishna lays out here is the principle and then spends the rest of the song telling us about the practice of it, how we can rally the emotions around toward it. Well, we leave it there today then. We just end off then with Sri Ramakrishna's statement on this. He who sees me everywhere and sees all in me, he never becomes lost to me, nor do I become lost to him. Sri Ramakrishna says, sweetmeats in the shape of various animals, birds and men, are made from the same stuff, sugar. Likewise, it is the Satchit Ananda that has assumed the forms of the sentient and the insentient in the universe. That is a wonderful thing to understand. And can you see the wonderful practical effect it will have, an impact it will have on the world, if we all saw things in this way. So the realization being steady, the relationship then between this yogi and the Paramatman is further elucidated in the other stanzas. And so next week we'll pick up on stanza 31 
And then that leads up to Arjun's question, the important question, that the rest of mind has to be resisted. And how easy is that, that we are all uh, living with a turbulent mind? And how can we get the serenity and the reassurance that follows? Om Shanti Shanti Shanti. Peace, peace, peace beyond the all.